Would you give the ladies who did this a hand clap? Amazing, amazing. You guys are ready for the season, right? And we know the reason we celebrate Christmas. Amen? Amen. It is always a joy for me to be here. I have been serving alongside of our pastors for about 15 years. And so it is good to be in the house today. I have a word I want to deliver to you this morning. Are you ready for the word? All right, let me pray and we're going to dive right into it today. Father, in Jesus' name, how grateful we are each time we get an opportunity to come and to open up your word. We have the privilege and the freedom to come every Sunday. Wow. And no one hinders us from coming to worship you. So we thank you for that freedom today. We thank you for the word. We thank you for life. We thank you for the breath that we breathe every day. Holy Spirit, we invite you to continue to do in this house what you have already done in the worship. Would you speak to the hearts of your sons and daughters? Would you cause them to hear what the Spirit of the Lord wants them to hear today? I decrease in this place so that you would increase. You said if we lift you, you would draw men unto you. Draw by your spirit today is our prayer. Amen. Amen. We are grateful that you're joining us online. I am going to talk to you from the topic, Jesus rescued me. Has he rescued anyone in this place today? Yes, yes, we can all testify of the goodness of the Lord and how he has rescued us. Um, as I go through this message this morning, I want you to put yourself in this story and think about where you were when Jesus came and when he rescued you. Has anyone had a tough year this year? Been a tough year? You ready for the year to go by? All right, you know what? Jesus can redeem even the toughest year you have had. So in this last month of the year, we're going to believe that everything that you have prayed for, stood for, believed for, that Jesus will redeem that for you before the year ends. So I start with a question. Has anyone ever rescued you from a difficult situation? Right? They were a lifesaver when you thought you had no hope. From what do you need rescuing today? Even through our painful and difficult times, even through our trials and tribulations, Jesus is right there with us. Matthew 5, 45 says, It rains on the just as well as on the unjust. That means that believers and unbelievers alike will have some good days, and we'll have some difficult days. The difference between us, the believers, and the unbelievers is that in our difficult days, Jesus is walking with us. Amen? When you think about Jesus and you think about his sacrifice in Calvary, he was sinless, yet he suffered. He did not have to go through all that he did, but he did it to rescue you and to rescue me. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. If Jesus had not shed his blood, you and I would not be forgiven today and have freedom to enter into his presence any time that we want. Amen? His sacrifice was necessary for our freedom. So I know, like me, you are very thankful for what Jesus has done. Amen? Amen? A couple years ago, I was out of town, and I was heading to Atlanta, and I was at a meeting that did not go very well. And so I decided to go back by myself. I rented a vehicle, and when the company delivered the vehicle to the hotel, and I got into the vehicle, I said, this looks like a toy car. It was so small. And so as I sat in the car, the Lord said to me, don't drive this car back to Atlanta. He says, when you go in to the, the store, ask them to give you a bigger car. 
So I walked in, and I got to the counter, and I started to say, the Lord said. <laughs> then I caught myself and remembered where I was. I said, I need a bigger car to get me to Atlanta. So we exchanged the car. There was a reason why the Lord needed me to have a bigger car. Because an hour into the trip, with the praise and worship going, with me singing songs to the Lord, always praying before I drive anywhere, an 18-wheeler hit me going almost 80 miles an hour and zigzagged me across a four-lane highway. Praise is to God. No other traffic was coming, and I ended up in a ditch. And I walked out of that accident without a broken bone. We all have reasons to be thankful to God. So today I want to walk you through the story of a woman in the Bible that Jesus rescued. I believe that as we go through her life, you will see yourself in her story. And you will see what Jesus will do for you no matter what it is that you're facing. So John chapter 11, verse 1 through verse 3. Turn there with me. John chapter 11, verse 1 through verse 3. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one who you love is sick. John identifies this Mary as a woman who anointed Jesus, Lazarus' sister, we have heard about her many times, how she sat at the feet of Jesus while Martha was doing all the preparation and Martha was complaining about how she was not working alongside of her. This woman found herself in some serious situation. She was demonically possessed. Jesus cast seven demons out of her. When Jesus encountered her, she was in the pit, she was in devastation, she was lost, and Jesus rescued her from the bondage to slavery and to sin. How she becomes so totally possessed, no one knows. But her life of sin was against the law. And because she was in sexual immorality, she could have been stoned to death. Jesus rescued her. He told her, leave your life of sin. But she did not have the power and the strength within herself to leave this life that she was caught up in. But Jesus did set her free from demonic possession. And only he could set her free, make her whole, and set her on the right path. When she came to anoint Jesus, she wanted to say thank you for what he had done to her, what he had done for her. Her love, her gratitude, her thanksgiving for him was so abundant that she came to Jesus bringing the only thing she had that was valuable. Luke 7, 47 said, it was only after she washed Jesus' feet that Jesus forgave her sins. I want you to truck with me this morning. He had cast the demons out of her, he had set her free, but he had not at that point forgiven her sins. Imagine the shame, the embarrassment, how she felt, the guilt she felt. And she's walking around with this guilt, and Jesus is invited to a dinner, and she shows up to the dinner without an invitation. Can I ask a question? Have you ever kept, crashed a party? Ah, oh, come on. Have you ever crashed a party? This woman crashed the party. Nobody invited her. Nobody wanted her there. But God the Father was setting the stage to do something amazing in her life. And as he did that amazing work in her life, he's given us an example in the Bible of what he wants to do also in our lives. Now go with me to John, Luke chapter 7, 36 through 38. Luke chapter 7, 36 through 38. 
Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in the town learned that Jesus was eating at this Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on Jesus. Now when Jesus accepted this invitation, he knew that God was set in a stage to do something amazing in this woman's life, but also in the lives of these Pharisees because they were very pious. They did not want women around. And this one had a stained, sinful reputation. That is why Jesus accepted the invitation. Here is what Jesus did. He was not averse to go into the very pit of hell to rescue us. So he went in the midst of these people who thought they were more righteous than this woman because he knew God was about to do something in her life. I want you to know something. Every struggle, every difficulty, every failure, every hardship that you have gone through, Jesus will not waste a single bit of it. He will use all of it for his glory and to give you a promotion if you will allow him to use the brokenness of your life for his glory. So she walked into this party. No one invited her. Alabaster was made from stones normally found in Palestine. It resembled white marble. It was precious stone. It was expensive. She takes this very expensive bottle with perfume and she broke the contents of it getting ready to pour it on the Savior. What I want you to know this morning is that the Pharisees and the disciples started, even the disciples were complaining. Why are you breaking this expensive thing and pouring it on Jesus? They had no understanding what she was doing. She was literally beginning the preparation for Jesus' burial, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. They did not understand what she was doing. So they began to murmur and complain about her wasting all that money. This perfume she poured on Jesus was a year's wages. In today's market, it's probably worth more than you and I make. So let me ask a couple questions. Would you give Jesus a year's wages? Nah. Many of us would reason we could not afford it, right? We're going to be honest in the house this morning. We would not survive if we gave Jesus a year's wages, right? How would we pay our bills? How would we eat? Mary did not hesitate to pour everything she had earned on Jesus. In going to this Pharisee's house, she broke every tradition in the book. It was unheard of for women to be at any of these events. Their role was to cook the food and serve the food, but they were never invited to sit at the table. How far we have come as women today. Amen? Amen. You need to give the, the Lord a hand clap for that. It was customary in those days when a visitor came in that slaves would wash their feet from the dust of the journey. Each guest would be greeted with a kiss and their heads would be anointed with oil. As Mary observed Jesus' arrival, nobody washed his feet, nobody kissed him, nobody anointed him. Jesus set this perfect stage for Mary to do what she was about to do. Now, this part of the story some of you ladies are not going to like, but stay with me, okay? In that century, it was not the norm for a woman to approach a man. Ouch. How would that work today, right? She could not kiss a man in public. She definitely could not approach a man with such a high standing position. 
This was a private dinner. Nobody had invited her. It was rude for her to show up. But God invited her to the dinner because God wanted to do something amazing in her life. The reason the story is in the Bible is because God wants you to know that he is going to do some amazing things also in our lives. It is evident that Mary had not planned to watch Jesus' feet. She went there with the intention of pouring the perfume on him, but she did not know how she was going to do it. If she had planned it, she would have had a towel, she would have had water, she would have had a basin, is that right? She did not know what she was going to do, but the moment she walked into the presence of Jesus, God so captivated her heart, it led her into a deeper place of worship, and this worship was more than Mary could stand because she had been freed from these demons, but she had not yet gotten salvation. The Bible said that Mary does not approach Jesus from the front. She is too embarrassed. She is too ashamed. She feels unworthy. Has anybody been there this morning? She approaches Jesus from behind. She couldn't face him directly. She approaches him from behind, and she began to do what they had not done when he walked in. She began to kiss his feet. She began to water his feet with her tears. She began to dry his feet with her hair. Now, I want you to get a picture of these pious religious men looking at this woman who they knew had a stained reputation and cursing her if she could just hear them. Why is she here? She's a sinner. She lives in sin. How dare she walks into this dinner that she was not invited to? They did not invite her, but God invited her. Since no one had anointed Jesus, Mary poured the perfume on Jesus. She not only gave her heart away to him, but she gave him everything she owned. As she kissed his feet, tears began to flow. Tears of regret. Tears for the loss of her dignity. Tears for the many lost years of her life. Tears that she had been held in bondage for so long. Tears of the many regrettable decisions she had made. Mary poured her pain, her heartbreak, her sorrow, her regret, she poured it all on Jesus. As she performed her humble task, her tears were thanksgiving. Her tears were, were love and gratitude for all that Jesus had done for her. I was talking to somebody recently, and they said to me, they said, there are times when I hear a song and the tears begin to flow. There are times when I hear a message and tears just well up in my soul. And she said, I don't know why I cry so often. And I said, you cry so often because those tears are a reflection of what Jesus has done in your heart and in your life to set you free. Those tears represent God. I so appreciate what you did for me at Calvary. Since she had no towel to dry his feet, she used her hair. 1 Corinthians 11:15 says, a woman's hair is her glory. So Mary used something precious once again on Jesus. In Jesus' century, the women had long hair, but they always wore them bound. And the reason they did was because women in the pagan culture would let their hair down in worship of their pagan gods. So Mary unbound her hair in the midst of these men, which was not normal for her to do, so she could use her hair to wash Jesus' feet because she had no towel. This woman is emptying herself 
not only before Jesus, but also before those who were judging her. As she worshiped him, her worship became so intense, as is often the case with us, when we remember what Jesus Christ has done for us, our worship becomes intense because we are so grateful and we are so thankful for what he has done. She lingered in her worship. She did not allow the onlookers who were judging her and cursing her to stop her from worshiping Jesus. Listen, when you're in the presence of the Savior, everything else should really just melt away. And that's what happened to Mary. She did not hur hurry through her worship, her prayer, her thanks to Jesus. Like Mary, we must allow the worship. We must allow ourselves to linger in the presence of the Lord, to worship him for all that he's done for us. The men were looking at her. They were disgusted with her. Their stares were probably penetrating. If they got a hold of Mary, she would really suffer the consequences. This did not stop her. So let me ask, what stopped you from worshiping? What stops you from giving thanks? What stops you from, if you're sitting down with your coworkers for lunch, from bowing your heads and saying grace over your meals? What stops you from giving glory, thanks, and adoration to the King of Heaven? If anything stops you from praising God in public, then you must ask yourself, am I ashamed of Jesus? Am I ashamed of the relationship that I have with him? Mary did not allow anything to stop her because she was so thankful to Jesus. Here's my last scripture. Luke 7, 39 says this. It says, when well, I'm going to begin at 43, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins, he's finally forgiven her of her sins, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Jesus now is defending Mary because the men are judging her. We can well imagine what was taking place in their hearts. Most of them probably knew of her damaged reputation. There would be consequences that they got a hold of her later. Not only did Mary give all she had financially, she gave all she had emotionally and reputationally. If looks could have killed, Mary would have not survived that encounter with those people. Galatians 2.20 described Mary. It says, I am crucified with Christ, yet it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what she was doing. She laid it all down. She knew they did not want to be in the presence of a sinner such as she was. But her desire to worship, to give thanks, to bless, to anoint, and to magnify Jesus was greater than anything they could do to her. When Mary finished her task, there was nothing left of her. She had left it all at the feet of Jesus. When she walked away from him, she was empty of everything she had carried for so long. 
but she was filled to overflowing with the presence of the Savior who had now taken up residency in her heart. Her worship meant everything to her. So Jesus decides he needed to defend Mary. Simon's thoughts were critical about Mary. So Jesus addressed them. Simon did not speak the words out of his mouth. He thought them in his heart. And Jesus addressed what he was thinking. Simon was not only judging Mary, he was also judging Jesus. He was saying if he was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was who was anointing him. Simon was more critical of Jesus than of the woman. So since Jesus accepted the sinner, Simon thought, Jesus is not a prophet. We don't have to listen to him. We don't have to worship him. We don't have to serve him. Can you imagine what happened when Jesus addressed his thoughts exactly like he had thought them? What Simon and the others did not understand is that Jesus loves all people. He loves the greatest of sinners. Can I say it again this morning? Jesus loves the greatest of sinners. I don't care what we have done. That love that ran down Calvary was for us. And that is why today we are free. And the Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The Bible says he came to seek and save the lost. Mary was a daughter of a king. She was a princess in his eyes, but the enemy had caused her not to realize how valuable she was to God. I want to ask you a question in this house this morning. Do you know that you're a prince, you're a king, you're a princess, you're a queen in God's kingdom? Do you know your value in him? Are you allowing the enemy to tell you that you're less than who you are? The Bible says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are the apple of his eyes. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. He calls you kings and priests in his house. We have allowed the enemy to tell us who we are not. Jesus is restoring this. Jesus got involved in the struggles of his people. He got involved in our struggles. Right now today, I started with a question, had you, have you had a rough year? And you said you did. I want you to know that Jesus is involved in that struggle. Jesus pointed to the things that Simon had not done when he came into the house. Then he pointed to the fact that Mary had humbled herself and outdid Simon in every way possible. Jesus gave us one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. If you love much, if you're forgiven much, you will love much. Have you been forgiven a lot? Do you love Jesus with a depth that is unexplainable? I've said it to you before, many of us love Jesus, but very few of us are in love with him because when you are in love with him, you always want to be in his presence. There is a difference. I want to give you a few lessons from this story as I close. The love and grace of Jesus is not logical and cannot be reasoned away. That is why you're so blessed today. People will shun you because of your sins, but not Jesus. He loves you in spite of them. Jesus loves the greatest of sinners. Mary was not competing with the people in the room. She was not competing with any of them as she served Jesus, but she outdistanced them all with her humility and her love and her thankfulness and her devotion because of what Jesus had done for her. 
Our pursuit of Jesus strengthens and deepens our worship of him. True life changing worship happens at the feet of Jesus. Mary went to the feet of Jesus. That's the place you and I have to go all the time so that we can connect to Jesus in a way that will be forever transforming in our lives. When we understand how much Jesus has done for us, when we remember Calvary, when we remember Golgotha's hill, when we remember the blood that ran down that hill for us, when we remembered how he struggled to carry that cross, when we remember the nails that pierced his hands and pierced his sides, when we remember he did not cry out until he cried out from the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what we're doing. While he was dying, he was forgiving the ones who were murdering him. When we remember what Jesus has done for us, we will forever worship him. Mary came to Jesus with a repentant heart. Jesus did not turn her away. When you and I come and when we repent, he does not turn us away. Her tears, her shame, her unworthiness, and even her fear of being rejected could not keep Mary away from Jesus. True worship of God can never be hindered by your critics or by any negative words because it comes from your heart. This is how Mary's life ended. When she won her freedom, she was free indeed. She never went back. Here's what she did in Luke chapter 8. She journeyed with Jesus and supported his ministry. In Mark 15 and John 19, she was at the crucifixion when he died. In John 20, she was at the resurrection. She was also probably in the 120 who receive the Holy Spirit. She never turned back once she became free. Don't you dare turn back. No matter what the enemy throws at you, and he throws us some weapons at us. Don't you allow what the enemy does to cause you to believe that Jesus is not fighting for you because he always is. May her story of being transformed from the inside out remind us today that the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary was free to us, but it cost him everything. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that there is not one thing in this Bible, not one story that you have written here that is not meant for us. I prayed, Lord, this morning that your sons and your daughters heard that the same love that you gave to that woman caught in sin, demonically possessed, that that same love today is available to us. Thank you for what you did at Calvary for us. In Jesus' name. If you're watching online, or if you are here in the house this morning and you don't have a relationship with the Savior, you will never understand that depth of love until you invite him into your hearts. So if you're here and you don't know the Lord, or even if you're watching online, I just want you to say this prayer with me. Say, so Father, in the name of Jesus, today, I'm so thankful for what you did at Calvary to forgive me of my sins. Today I ask you, forgive me, wash me, set me on the right path. I thank you that Jesus died, he rose again, and today he's seated at your right hand praying for me. Thank you, Jesus, 
for saving me, I pray. In Jesus' name. If you're here this morning, you said you've had a tough year. If you've lost loved ones, if you're struggling with grief, if you're struggling with a health challenge, if you're struggling financially, if you're struggling in a relationship, is if depression is trying to set in, Jesus, your Savior, is here to rescue you today. Would you stand? If you're here and you just need him to touch your heart. If you don't mind, sometimes the, bless, the best place to meet with Jesus is at the altar. Would you come? Let's come meet him right here at the altar. Thank you, Father. If you need rescue in this morning, from whatever it is the enemy has done and is trying to do to you, come meet Jesus right here at the altar. He's here, he's willing, he's ready, he's available. So Jesus, here we are. Here are your sons and here are your daughters. Father, you heard them say earlier that it's been a tough year. We come right now to the altar. Father, symbolic of laying at your feet just like Mary did. And just like you rescued Mary, God, I am asking you today to rescue them from whatever it is that's going on in their hearts and in their lives and in their families and in their finances those that are experiencing depression i pray that the spirit of the lord will begin to cause that depression to flee from you spirit of depression i speak to you today in the name of the lord jesus christ and i command you to get away from god's children in the name of the lord i speak to those who are sick i speak to those who are grieving I speak to those who have been broken hearted this year. I speak to those who have family members that are ill. I speak prayer over the one who I heard when I walked in this place whose family is grieving this morning because of the loss. Oh God, I call on to you right now. And I say, God of mercy, God of grace, God of mercy over your children. Would you come right now? Bring hope and peace in the midst of their struggles as we enter the holiday season where so many people commit suicide because they feel so hopeless i pray that hopelessness will not touch any of your children holy spirit how we need you would you come today pour your love pour your hope Pour your compassion, pour your peace, pour your joy into every heart and into every life. And would you remind them that they're sons and daughters, that they're kings and priests in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for your sacrifice at Calvary. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you give him a hand clap of praise? Let him know how much you appreciate him. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. That's the end of our service. We are so grateful that you came this morning. Remember what Jesus did for Mary. And know that he will do the same for you. God bless you.